And so I'm not positive that Jesus is God, but I'm throwing in with Jesus rather than throwing in with you guys because you guys can't tell me how it all got here. You guys don't know. We're working on it. Physicists are oh, When you get it, then maybe I'll listen. Yeah. Well, why should there be something instead of nothing? Creation is 100% scientific proof there was a creator. You cannot have a creation without a creator. So where did everything come from? Why is there something instead of nothing? How did life begin? These are not trivial questions, and the answers may offer us profound insight into the very nature of the cosmos itself. Unfortunately, our current scientific understanding is still very ignorant about the detailed origins of life, the universe, and everything. Yet despite this fact, swarms of believers still feel perfectly justified in declaring hard certainty about one of the deepest mysteries of everything. The situation is even further complicated by the embarrassing rational justifications typically employed in these declarations. Observation. I have no clue how something as big and complex as the universe got here. Conclusion. Some great and powerful deity must have magically poofed it all into existence with a deliberate, conscious motive and did it all with human beings specifically in mind. The especially sad part about this argument is how comically easy it is to debunk. For example, if the universe is too mysterious and complex to arise through natural causes, then how exactly do we solve the puzzle by arbitrarily postulating the existence of something even more mysterious and even more complex? Or better yet, how do we even conclude that there was only a single creator rather than, say, 7, 10, or 80 bajillion? And if complex things cannot exist without the need for deliberate creators, then who created the creator? But as well, just because science doesn't know everything doesn't mean you can fill in the gaps with whatever fairy tale most appeals to you. So obviously, such arguments are nothing more than classic God of the Gaps reasoning. When faced with a profound hole in our understanding, there appears to be a very prolific tendency to fill the void with unsubstantiated postulations. Yet despite such logical ineptitude, millions of believers are still genuinely convinced by these arguments. Such behavior therefore presents a far more down-to-earth puzzle that deserves sincere inquiry. Namely, why are so many people compelled by such obviously lame logic? Consider the following experiment. Meet Bob. Now despite the fact that you know nothing about him, I want you to rank Bob's personality on an 8 point scale. To help you with Bob's evaluation, I have interviewed 6 random acquaintances of his and derived 6 adjectives to describe him. Ready? Here are your words. Smart. Artistic. Sentimental. Cool. Awkward. Fault finding. Easy enough, right? Some words are obviously favorable, while some words are not. It should therefore be no surprise to find that people will, on average, rank Bob with a favorability score of 1.38. Now, let's shake things up a bit. Meet Carl. Again, I want you to rank the favorability of Carl's personality based on six adjectives. Ready? Here is your new set of words. Fault finding. Awkward. Cool, sentimental, artistic, smart. As we can see, this is the exact same set of words, but in reverse order. And remember that as far as you know, these words have been selected at random from people who are acquainted with Carl. The information is therefore exactly the same, and we should expect to arrive at the same mean score for Carl's favorability, right? Wrong. In reality, the words in our list were not random at all, but were instead designed to serve as a gradual transition between favorable and unfavorable traits. For the case of Bob, positive adjectives were presented first and then gradually transitioned into negative. For the case of Carl, negative adjectives were followed by the positive. So even though the information is exactly the same in both cases, the order in which information is presented turns out to have a significant impact on our final impressions. When negative words are presented before the positive, subjects tend to respond slightly negatively when scoring Carl's favorability. The difference between these two scores is called the primacy effect. When people attempt to render judgments under uncertain conditions, a natural tendency is to experience greater influence from the information that comes along earlier rather than later. 
Now, with this information in mind, consider another experiment. Suppose you are the hiring manager at a major firm. Your task is to evaluate the potential success or failure of the company's new president, Phil. To aid you in your evaluation, you will be presented with a tape recording of Phil's behavior under various business conditions. Unbeknownst to you, however, the recording has been deliberately rigged to provide you with positive experiences first, followed by negative. Concurrently, another group of subjects will be given negative information first, followed by positive. Next, suppose I continue on to tell you that this research is still in the pilot phase and we're really not sure how valid your results will turn out to be. Furthermore, due to professional ethics, we really can't tell you how Phil truly performed in his job and you will never actually get to see how good of a prediction you made. In short, you can make whatever predictions you want and no one will hold you accountable for it. Given such loose expectations for the experiment, subjects naturally have little motivation to objectively evaluate all the data and produce an accurate judgment. We should therefore not be surprised when we measure a large degree of overall primacy. Now, let's shake things up a bit. To help motivate you into providing an accurate evaluation, you are instead informed that this research is very important to companies around the world and that you will be expected to justify your answer before a large group. Furthermore, your results will be publicly compared against Phil's actual job success and everyone will get to see how smart you really are at predicting job performance. This generates a high degree of what is called evaluation apprehension, meaning that you now have a strong motivation to examine all the evidence and produce a justifiable prediction. Surely, such conditions will reduce the tendency for primacy, right? Well, as a matter of fact, yes. When evaluation apprehension is high, subjects really did weigh the evidence in a more balanced light. Now, let's shake things up some more. Suppose I place a three minute deadline on your ability to generate an answer. In fact, just to remind you of the hurry you're in, there will even be a guy standing next to you with a stopwatch, ready to scoop up your results the moment time is over. So although your evaluation apprehension is high, we have also added time pressure to the mix. Consequently, you have every motivation to produce whatever answer comes to mind first, rather than relax and ponder over all the evidence. Surely, the addition of time pressure will offset evaluation apprehension and increase the tendency for primacy, right? Once again, yes. When subjected to a combination of both time pressure and evaluation apprehension, time pressure wins and primacy tends to increase. The reason is because time pressure generates an artificial sense of what psychologists call a need for cognitive closure. In other words, subjects need to produce an answer very quickly and any answer is preferable to confusion and ambiguity. Consequently, the natural result is a behavior known as seizing and freezing, meaning subjects simply latch on to whatever information comes along first and then ignore any information that comes along later. So in summary, not only is primacy a common, reproducible phenomenon, but its effects can also be exaggerated through environmental manipulation. Time pressure, mental exhaustion, and even a noisy environment are all known to increase the tendency for primacy when forming judgments in uncertainty. So, what does all this have to do with the god of the gaps? Well, primacy is so prolific and quantifiable that it can even be measured in terms of an intrinsic aspect of human personality. Don't believe me? Then consider the following experiment. Suppose again that you are a hiring manager at a major firm, only this time you have been pre-screened by your score on the need for closure scale. Such a metric is nothing more than a self-evaluated questionnaire and measures an individual's generic desire for concrete answers as opposed to confusion or ambiguity. People who score high are naturally classified as high need for closure, while people who score low are classified as low need for closure. Just like the previous experiment, your job is to evaluate the potential job success of the company's new president, Phil. To help you evaluate your final judgment, you have again been presented with a tape recording of his job performance under various business conditions. Of course, unbeknownst to you, the recording has been specially rigged to present information in either a positive-negative or a negative-positive order. Now, if you are the kind of person who likes to evaluate all the facts before rendering some kind of judgment, 
you should theoretically score low on the need for closure scale. Nevertheless, primacy has already been established as a fairly ubiquitous aspect of human nature. Surely, a simple tally on some baloney psychological survey could never lead to measurable predictions in human behavior, could it? Absolutely, yes. Individuals who scored low on the need for closure scale turned out to be virtually immune to primacy effects altogether. No matter what order the information was presented in, low-need subjects actually gave roughly equal evaluations on Phil's potential job success. So, if low-need subjects provided equal results, does this really mean that primacy is more pronounced for those who score high on the need for closure scale? Once again, yes. For subjects with high need for cognitive closure, the primacy effect is dramatically apparent. Such individuals are genuinely inclined to evaluate their world on the sole basis of which information comes along first. So whenever people find themselves truly compelled by empty arguments from ignorance or pure god-of-the-gaps logic, what exactly is happening? Here's how it works. Individuals with a high need for cognitive closure also have a strong propensity for primacy. That means for any situation involving uncertainty, confusion, or ambiguity, whatever answer comes along first to fill the gap is going to be merrily snagged up with little hesitation. Once an answer is seized upon, the subject necessarily freezes on the issue by blissfully ignoring all subsequent information, even if it conflicts with the original conclusion. This is why God of the Gap's arguments are so compelling to so many people. God did it is such a common answer to so many questions that individuals with high need for closure cannot help but latch onto it when presented with profound uncertainties about life. If people were simply honest about these questions by answering them with firm assertions of nobody knows, then even that answer would potentially suffice to fill the need for cognitive closure. I can live with doubt and uncertainty and not knowing. I think it's much more interesting to live not knowing than to have answers which might be wrong. So finally, given all this information, how do we combat the natural human tendency to argue out of ignorance? First, we need to understand that despite the logical absurdity of the God of the Gaps, it is still a perfectly compelling argument for those with a high need for closure. Secondly, when questioned about the origins of life, the universe, and everything, hemming and hawing does not do any good. Unless we can provide a clear and detailed answer to a given question, we must learn to be perfectly comfortable with the concept of I don't know. It is firm, it is honest, and it satisfies the need for closure that so many of us possess. Finally, evaluation apprehension is a demonstrable tool for reducing the primacy effects inherent to the need for closure. This means it is essential that we hold each other accountable for the reasoning we use to generate our beliefs and motivate each other to examine all available evidence before arriving at a conclusion. We must therefore emphasize the importance of seeking out truth with sincere academic discipline and intellectual honesty, lest we find ourselves overly confident in our own erroneous conclusions based on ill-informed assumptions. The arguments, if we can dignify it with such a phrase, went something like this. I can't see a thing on the surface of Venus. Why not? Because it's covered with a dense layer of clouds. Well, what are clouds made of? Water, of course. Therefore, Venus must have an awful lot of water on it. Therefore, the surface must be wet. Well, if the surface is wet, it's probably a swamp. If there's a swamp, there's ferns. If there's ferns, maybe there's even dinosaurs. Observation. You couldn't see a thing. Conclusion. Dinosaurs. <laughs>